So what we're going to do here, and I have a little outline on my phone, so I'll occasionally uh, glance at this. Um, but what we're going to do is, and you might have seen the title of this, uh, this live stream, which I called something like, I changed it a couple times, so it was like seven practice strategies that could make all the difference or something like that. I originally said that could change your life, seven practice strategies that could change your life. Uh, but I don't want to sound too hyperbolic, but re realistically, they, they very much could, or, or one thing from this very much could. I, and I'm choosing to bring things here uh, to the table that uh, I would say changed my life and, and you know, changed the way I'm thinking about music and practicing and learning. I mean, really changed in a big way. Um, so maybe I should call it that. But in any case, um, I had kind of outlined seven uh, just casual ways that I think about practicing that I wanted to... Uh, just talk through with you and then and then do a Q&A and, and uh, answer some questions. However, because this is one of my favorite topics and I get very excited, this has expanded now into, I think there's like 16 things now. So I am going to try to go through them quickly. Um, and, and there's one particular thing, the, the, the first point in particular, we're going to talk about what deliberate practice is, which is the official uh, psychology scientific term for uh, for the way that experts practice. So first we're going to go through that and that is absolutely critical to understand. That is the life-changing part. That could be very much life-changing. Then there's a bunch of other tips, things I've tried, um, different aspects of you know structuring our practice that I'll go through and just and just suggest things you can try for yourself. Um, and then we'll do a QA. and a and uh, especially would be cool if the Q&A is uh, something you're challenged by that you you um, want to improve at in a, in a more efficient way. And we could talk about the design of how to practice that. But the fun thing about Q and A is also just ask anything you want. And, and, uh, we will, uh, we'll go over those and I would love to interact at the end of this. So that's kind of what we're going to go over here. So uh, I will also say, um, I have a bunch of freebies that I give away, a bunch of PDFs and awesome guitar resources, uh, on my channel that I always give away. Uh, what would be a fun one to mention on this live stream? That's about practicing because we're going to talk about practicing being very challenging and how it should be challenging. Probably the hardest of the free downloads that I have is my arpeggio pack. Uh, it's it's just this dense uh, five positions of 12 different chord types, the chord tone arpeggio shapes for all of them all over the fretboard for like serious fretboard mapping. And the premise of that is, is basically um, to work towards being able to outline and target chord changes to improvise accurately over chords. But one doesn't have to use it for that. It could just be to map out the fretboard and see vocabulary better. That's probably the hardest thing I have out of my free downloads to practice. So I'm going to pitch it in this one and say, um, I'll, I have a link in the description already, or you can go to soundguitarlessons.com slash chord tones, just one word chord tones at the end there. Um, to get that. It's an awesome, just free pack. Uh, and people email me about like, whoa, how do I work on this? This is, this is, looks a little overwhelming. Um, there's a lot of stuff here and, and, and what do I do? So I'm, I'm throwing that out there now because we're going to talk about how to practice something in a way that is, is the most effective actual practicing. So that's, uh, if I'm going to talk about one of my free downloads, that's the one I chose to, chose to do for this one. So, uh, the first thing I want to say now, and like I said, I started with seven ideas, which is in the title here. And now we have like up to 16. We'll see, we might not even get through all of them because I don't, I don't want to go forever. And I want to, want to make sure this is, uh, keeps flowing for you. But the first thing I want to say, we're about to talk about deliberate practice, which is the, the science of, of, of real expert practice, which can really can be life changing. Um, but uh, as far as practice uh, structures go, strategies, uh, routines, stuff like this, um, I just want to say, and, and I've discovered this certainly over time, anything we try uh, in that respect, there, there's never a one right way. It's all a construct to get us back into the zone, to get us um, excited and enthusiastic again, to get us to feel like we can show up with the energy that we need to do real deliberate practice, which, are, which we're going to talk about in a second. Um, so as far as what's the best routine, what's the best time of day, what's the best way to split up you know, my time, what's the best, how do I structure, um, how much to practice this, 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 or this, it's all neutral. And so you just we just want to be, it's, it's all for the, like I said, a construct to help us feel, um, intuitively in the moment, is this extremely valuable time that I'm spending? Is this stimulating in the way that I want music and practicing to be stimulating? So if we get a little stale with our music time that we are spending with our learning time, with our practice time, whatever, our creative music time, 
then we then we get that itch to switch things up and i mean i'm talking from experience here because i am i have always been and i'm always switching that up uh when i practice how much how i'm going to track it am i going to am i going to do it um when i feel like it or am i going to say there's a certain amount of time i've tried everything you can anything you can think of i've tried so this is you know part of the q and a's you can ask me about different ways you know you're trying to practice but the the conclusion in the end is that they're all there, there's not a better way to do it that they're all ways to to get us to try to make sure we're feeling like in the moment or we can only know in the moment and getting in touch with ourselves to know uh is this time i'm spending is this the practice time and or the music time and or the whatever you want to you know your main goal is with it is it the way that i want it to feel and if it's not then we naturally search um, and if it's not, it's not because the thing, the way that we're approaching it isn't work is, is, is a bad way. It's just that we might need a little feeling of novelty or we might need, or something just might work for us. So that that's, that's different than somebody else. So, uh, certain things I've done have worked all the time. And a lot of times I'm just switching, switching it up. So just wanted to say, people ask me a lot about a practice routine and, I, and a lot of the list that we're going to go over here, a lot of the items is, uh, are, are suggestions to try. And I wanted to say that up front that they're all basically equal and that you can flip around to trying them just to find uh, what might work for you best. Okay. Um, and if you do have like a real burning question, I'll be, I'll be taking those to the end. Um, so if you type it in now, I might not see it, even though I'll, I'm happy to try to scroll through those later, but um, you might need to type it in again later or just save your question for it when we do the Q and A um, at the end here. So, uh, okay, super important. What is deliberate practice? Um, I sometimes call this real practice or uh, focus practice or active practice. Um, it's deliberate practice is the official term coined by the psychologist who is the expert on experts. And I've talked about uh, deliberate practice and I've talked about this particular psychologist on my channel a couple times. Um, and this is one of my favorite topics uh, of all time. And I'm always kind of trying to learn and read about it and, and get better at this skill. Uh, this scientist's name is Anders Ericsson. He actually recently passed away, unfortunately, but he uh, left a body of work um, and his life work was studying experts, uh, expertise, how they practice, what is the science of learning and practice and skill building. And uh, the coined term in the end for real effect, the most possibly effective, <laughs> the most possibly, the most effective practice possible is called deliberate practice, okay? Um, so I'll just outline it in the most simplistic terms here. Uh, there's, there's a lot of this. There's, if you're interested in going super deep on this, uh, Anders Ericsson has a book called Peak. Um, I can't remember the, the subtitle of it, but it's called Peak and it's absolutely mind blowing. Um, and a lot of what I've talked about comes from, comes from that book and, and various other books. So to, to outline what is deliberate practice in a very um oversimplified structure it's basically this four steps one you set a stretch goal uh you're identifying something that you cannot yet do you you identify clearly what is the objective that i want to do that i can't yet do your stretch goal uh what what problem am i trying to solve uh what is most difficult what's breaking down what can't i do zero in on that set a specific goal uh, and this is that that's what I'm gonna do. You set a stretch goal. There's a lot of details about how to do that and uh, effectively that we can talk about as well, but set a stretch goal. Uh, number two out of four for deliberate practice is that we focus fully, fully, fully on that, like full attention focus, like in the kind of way that we never naturally do in the kind of way that is not comfortable to do focus in a way that is straining and, and really makes you squirm. That is deliberate practice. And we'll talk more about this. Uh, and this is, again, this is what we naturally don't do. They, they say most people in life in general are doing zero amount of deliberate practice. Experts, actual experts in their field, the best of the best who excel, the reason they are is because they're doing this kind of deliberate practice. And even them, even them, they can't do more than at the most an hour and a half at a time. And that's a lot. I can't do an hour and a half of that, that kind of focus at a time. It'd be awesome to work up to that. But um, if you do experience this, we'll talk about how to how to uh, work on it more in a, in a second. You'll know the difference. It's like it's like the difference between you know you think you're we think we're practicing, we're noodling, or we're or we're kind of I'm going to play through this and 
naturally as soon as we get tired we, we switch to something else or whatever and it's like that's like taking a walk or, or taking a jog deliberate practice is like i'm gonna sprint as hard as i can for two minutes and two minutes doesn't seem long but try to sprint for two minutes it's crazy and afterwards you have that weird kind of endorphins feeling or that weird like um th th there's a certain kind of stimulation and high to it almost um, and, and with deliberate practice, that, that is a feeling that happens as well. So even five minutes of that kind of focus or 10 minutes of that kind of focus on a specific tr stretch goal, uh, it will feel different. It'll be like, oh, that's what it is. Um, and I know that because every time I come back to it and do it, I'm like, oh, there it is. That's what that feeling's supposed to be. Um, and, and it's very hard to get to. Um, step number three out of the four. Number one being you set a stretch goal, you focus on something you can't do, you set a stretch goal to, to do it, you focus crazy, fully, full attention, difficult focus on it. Step number three is that you seek negative feedback as immediately as possible. You get as as immediate feedback as, as much as you can, and you want to focus on, on that feedback. You want it to be what you're doing wrong. So you're getting, and this is just this, this is just the science of it. This is what Anders Ericsson discovered. Uh, and I'm just relaying to, relaying it to you here. So step number three is you, you try to get feedback and it doesn't have to be feedback from, uh, it's, it's amazing to get feedback from a, a person, a coach, an expert, uh, a teacher, but it doesn't actually mean that necessarily. This could easily mean if you're trying to sing and you want to be intonating better, or you put a drone on, this is what I do for singing, so that's why and I've been doing this recently, so I, it comes to mind. Your negative feedback could be that you can hear when you're out of tune or not um, and say, oh, I'm out, got to switch. So you're, you're seeking what's a feedback loop I can, I can have. So when you're practicing, it can be as simple as you know you hit a wrong note. That's okay, feedback, you got it. Now you, you try to fix it. So um, now, of course, we don't know what we don't know sometimes. So seeking out feedback from people is, is great as well. But... Um, that's step number three is you seek out feedback and you focus on the negative. What am I doing wrong that uh, that I can go back and try to fix? And step number four is very simple. It's just that you reflect on that honestly and you reiterate and repeat it until it is not a stretch goal anymore, until it is something that you can do that doesn't feel like a challenge anymore. That's it. That's the four steps of uh, deliberate practice in a nutshell. Um, so... I'm inclined to go in, interact and, and ask, uh, answer questions right now because I just love interacting. Uh, but I'm still, I'm going to save those for later because I want to fly through more of what I got here for you. So I hope that felt valuable. Uh, if we can implement that, it truly is the most game-changing possible thing you can learn. The, the, the best skill you can learn is the skill of how to do that because then you can really accelerate your learning of anything else. Um, and so uh, some of these extra tips here and principles are going to help you with with digesting how to go about that and how to improve your own practice and whatnot. So the next thing I'd like to go over is that I want to read a little segment uh, from the book called Grit. This is a book by another psychologist named uh, Angela Duckworth. And this is her kind of her life's work and her focus. She has a TED talk. You could, if you want to get a, a little sense of it, you can check out her four minute TED talk. And she has a book called Grit, which I do recommend um, if you're into reading about these things. So in the book, there's a section on practice uh, and grit is uh, the idea of passion and perseverance over a long period of time. Passion and perseverance, really the stick to that we need. And the premise here is that this principle, this determination and uh, perseverance in something, whether we think we have talent with it or not, whether we think we're naturally good at it, which is, you know, challenging that idea. Same with same with deliberate practice, challenging that idea. Um, that this wins over other elements of our uh, personality and our, and our efforts, that having grit over time uh, w takes the cake. It, it, we can accomplish what we want to accomplish and or learn what we want, want to learn or get better at what we want to get better at with this, with this sense of grit, which is really delayed gratification. Are we willing to work hard for it and, and not having the just immediate uh, returns, which is not going to happen for difficult skills that we want to learn. So anyway, I want to read this segment where Angela Duckworth is uh, meeting with Anders Ericsson, who is the other psychologist that uh, discovered deliberate practice. Um, so I'm just going to read through this here. She says, look, Professor Ericsson, I've been jogging about an hour a day, several days a week since I was 18, and I'm not a second faster than I ever was. 
I've run for thousands of hours and it doesn't look like I'm anywhere close to making the Olympics. Erickson says, that's interesting. May I ask you a few questions? Sure, she says. Do you have a specific goal for your training? Ah, sound familiar from the deliberate practice? Uh, she says, to be healthy, to fit into my genes. He says, ah, yes, but when you go for a run, do you have a target in terms of the pace you'd like to keep or a distance goal? In other words, is there a specific aspect of your running that you're trying to improve? She says, um, no, I guess not. Then he ver and this, she goes on in the book. Then he verified that I wasn't keeping track of my runs in any systematic way. No diary of my pace uh, or my distance or the routes I took, my ending heart rate or how many intervals I'd sprinted instead of jogged. There was no variety to my routine. Every run was like the last. And so he says, ah, I think I understand. You aren't improving because you're not doing deliberate practice. And she goes on in the book. This is how experts practice. First, they set a stretch goal, zeroing in on one narrow aspect of their overall performance, rather than focus on what they already do well. Uh, experts strive to improve specific weaknesses. They intentionally seek out challenges they can't yet meet. Okay. Virtuoso violist Roberto Diaz describes working to find your Achilles heel, the specific aspect of music that needs problem solving. I love thinking of it as problem solving. I'm almost done here with this segment. Uh, then with undivided attention and great effort, experts strive to reach their stretch goal. This is basically what, what I went over, but from this book. Um, as soon as possible, experts hungrily seek feedback on how they did. Necessarily, much of that feedback is negative. This means that experts are more interested in what they did wrong so they can fix it than what they did right. Okay. I know it feels amazing to get praise and hear what you did right, but if we know what we, if we can figure out what we did wrong and work on that, that's how we get better. Uh, so trying to do things they can't yet do, failing and learning what they need to do differently is exactly the way experts practice. Feelings of frustration aren't a sign that they're on the wrong track. On the contrary, wishing they did things better is extremely common during learning. No surprises there really. And I, you know, that's just another way of going over what I said in my own words for deliberate, for, for deliberate practice. Um, that last segment is one of my favorite things to be reminded of. And I've mentioned this on my channel and I always talk about it in my courses and whatnot. Um, if it's hard, you're on the right track. If it's difficult, you have the most to gain. If it's difficult, it is a gold mine of learning because you found a weakness. Now, of course we want to, we need to decide, oh, this is the weakness I want to work on. Cause if it's not, then we're not gonna be inspired to work through how difficult it can be. Um, but this whole thing about uh, feelings of frustration aren't a sign that are on the wrong track. On the contrary, wishing they did things better is a common is common during learning for these experts. So sound familiar to all of us who get discouraged and who uh, feel like crap when we try to do something and we can't do it and we walk away uh, beating ourselves up or whatever. And I'd say certainly uh, uh, an amount of that is totally natural. Uh, and the habit that we can try to work on over time is to recognize that as, ah, there it is. Um, that means that I, I've hit the area that I need to be in. It, I don't think it means that we stop beating ourselves up and everybody's different. If someone's out there who never beats themselves up, amazing for you. Um, but there is, there has to be kind of, I think for myself, there has to be kind of a negative feeling of like, oh, like that, that feeling of like, I wish I could do this. Um, and, and what's, why can't I do this right now? Um, the most important mind shift the mindset change is that when we experience that, we have trust in ourselves. And the next thing I'm going to talk about is to help you with that trust in yourself, trust in ourselves that, oh, but no worries. If I work on this with the right types of practice techniques, I will absolutely improve at it. That's the most important mind shift because this is fixed mindset versus growth mindset, which is a big kind of uh, discovery over, I, I can't remember when, when that uh, became a thing. It might've even been in the nineties, but just this discovery that people who believe that they can change something or overcome it are the ones who end up doing it. And because it is possible, and we're gonna talk about more of that in, in a second, but if we, we have to believe, oh, okay, the, oh, I feel horrible that I can't do this. Oh, no matter how negative that feels, and maybe it doesn't feel negative to you, but it does for a lot of us. And then we have to say, cool, I am going to work on that. And when I do, I know, I trust 100% that it's possible that I will and can get better at it. And it's not about natural ability or whatever, whatever. Um, 
It's simply not. And we have to believe that. If we don't believe that, we're going to try. And as it gets hard, when it's really hard, which it's supposed to be, uh, that's when we want to give up on it. Um, and, and why would we push through if we're doubting if it's possible? If we're doubting at all that it's possible and it's so difficult to do even when it is possible, which it is, uh, we're not going to persevere through that, right? So we need to believe that it's possible. And it is. Okay, so why is it possible? Um, this is fun to, to think of it in this, in this way, which is, and I think this was from the, the Peak book as well by Anders Ericsson. Um, let's talk about what, you know, why does the body change and your mind change when you are trying to do something? You know, how does learning actually work? Well, one of the ways that uh, it was described was via homeostasis. This, uh, your, your body, your mind, your existence, your, you know, biologically. And I'm no expert on this stuff. I'm talking casual. I'm talking just someone who likes to read about this stuff. And I'm just relaying it to you. I'm, sh I'm sure people uh, reading maybe know, you know, more about it. And feel free to call me out if I ever say anything wrong. But uh, this is stuff that's helpful for me. Just trying to help you. Um, homeostasis. Okay, it's this idea that uh, you are, your, your body, your mind is trying to keep things as chill as possible, as kind of neutral as possible. Why? Because uh, exerting calories is dangerous for uh, sur a survival risk, right? Like uh, anything that uses calories is um, of concern because we want to conserve them as much as possible so we can survive because, well, in evolving, when evolving food was scarce, even though it's not so scarce for some people uh, now. So, um, so homeostasis, I like to remember that term because it just makes it like more clinical sounding to me. And, and it's not this kind of like, you can do it and just, okay, I think I can do it because someone said you're great. Um, like, oh, homeostasis, what's happening with homeostasis? Well, it's this, it's that, let's use the workout analogy, right? You do some sort of workout and, um, and if you really, really go, let's do that, like the two minutes of sprinting, uh, one minute of sprinting, whatever it is. And you're like, oh my gosh, that, that was so hard. Your body reacts in this way. It's like, what in the world just happened there? that was crazy and that used so many calories. And if that has to happen more and we have to use that many calories, we're gonna die. Uh, we better switch things up biologically or in the body or whatever is happening. Like I said, I don't actually know the nitty gritty details of this. Uh, well, we better change things so that when and if that happens again, we're ready for it and it doesn't use as many calories. Um, I love this because it's just so, so, so it's so clinical. Like I said, it's not it's not uh, woo woo kind of motivational, which I also love that stuff. So we'll we'll get to some of that too. But um, so with the brain, same thing. You use up calories when it's so difficult, and you're really trying, and that's what deliberate practice has to be. And the neural pathways are going to say, "Whoa, that was using so many calories. If that happens again a couple times, we're going to make it easier for that to happen." so we can conserve calories, so we can survive better, so we have a better risk, uh, a better chance of, of survival. So, okay, so if you're human at all, you can do this, right? We need to stop doubting ourselves that, is it possible that I could ever learn this thing or whatever? And hey, I'm that way too. I walk around like an Eeyore sometimes. Um, but that's, that's why I read this stuff and that's why I wanna help you with this stuff because when we can remember these principles, we can bounce back super quickly and, and see results and then be reminded later, think of those results and build on that and say, oh, well, last time there was a challenge like this, I got through it, so I know I can get through this next one. So homeostasis, it's kind of fun to think of that. Uh, that's just like, what's actually happening? Like, whoa, this was so hard because it used calories and, and I'm not used to it, didn't have the neural pathways for what I'm supposed to do coordination-wise or mentally or whatever. Um, and as I do it more, it's going to get easier because the body wants it to be easier for survival sake. So that's how practicing and improvement works. Again, hey, shoot me an email. If I ever say something that's like totally wrong, shoot me an email. I love uh, learning and being corrected and whatnot. Uh, but this is just stuff I read about and, and think about all the time. And it's, I could talk about it all day, which I mean, I'm already been going for a bit here. <laughs> so, um, okay, next item. We're, we're gonna do a Q and A after this. So so hang on if you, if you have questions. Um, this is one, so now I'm going to bounce through some, some things quickly. Those were big ones that I wanted to talk about. Now I just want to talk about more casual, a few kind of casual points, and then we'll get to the, get to the Q&A. But I do have a, a list of it. So uh, this is one that I like to think of. No one can do anything that they haven't practiced. Why in the world would someone be able to do something that they haven't practiced? This is just me. This is my own concept that I think of. Uh, and here's where it comes from. 
every single time that I got bummed out about somebody else being able to do something, some skill, music especially, right? Uh, comparing myself. This is something we all do, or most of us. If, if you don't, then you're a superhero. Um, so every single time I've done, compared myself to someone and got uh, bummed, oh, I, why can't I do that? They can do that. Oh my gosh, they're so good. Uh, if I ask myself the question, and I encourage, you, I encourage you to do this exercise. If I simply ask myself the question, have I practiced that? Um, and of course, there can be more details though, because maybe, maybe we have. But like, have I really focused on practicing that? Have I made that a focus of what I want to improve at? And have I practiced? And the answer every time is no. I honestly ask myself that when I feel I'm like, oh. And, and so when someone's doing some flashy, crazy, percussive guitar thing, and it's like, oh, they're so good. Well, have we practiced that? And is that what we want to practice? And is that what we want to, you know, become an expert at? Because if we really did want to have that be our focus, we could become expert at it if we practice in the right way. So every time I, I notice that, I'm like, have I practiced that? And then I, and then I, so every time I'm like, no, I haven't. Oh, that's why I'm not good at it. Oh, that's why they're better at it. Cause they have been practicing that. And then I ask myself, well, do I want to practice that? And usually it's no, cause if I did, I would have been doing it already. Or if it really is something that shifts, you know, the direction you go, that's cool too. You can get inspired and kind of, that's how we start new sounds and new, and, uh, new styles that we haven't played before. So that's just a thing I like to remind myself. Nobody can do anything that they haven't practiced. And by the way, some people think they can, but they, <laughs> they can't. Some people think they can do, oh, I don't know. I can just do this thing. Well, people practice things without knowing they're practicing. It's just a rep. It's whatever they're doing. If you're doing something for fun or as a kid, you, you know, did math problems in your head all the time. Like you're practicing, you're getting experience with something, even if you're not thinking of it as that, even if it's not deliberate practice, there's, um, familiarity with with certain skills that um, can develop and it's still a version of practicing um, okay next item like I said I'm gonna try to fly through these I know I talk a lot it's funny people comment on my channel all the time says you talk too much you talk too much you play more guitar um, and a lot of times I try to play guitar examples on my channel as much as possible when I'm but I'm teaching it's like a lot of those comments are funny I'm like did you want to uh, you, did you mean to go to Spotify and listen to music and you ended up here um, so anyway, yes, I like to talk. Maybe I should just have a podcast. But um, so this next one, uh, I want to just talk about practice design versus uh, practicing deliberate practice. So we outlined deliberate practice and what that is. Uh, well, it's very important that we actually have a, an exercise design. And if we spend, like if we don't know what we're practicing and we don't know the parameters and the rules for okay, if I do this exercise and if I follow these rules and these parameters in this way and it's unmistakable how I'm getting it right or getting it wrong, if we don't have that kind of game to play, um, it's nearly impossible to exert uh, the deliberate practice that we need. We need to know clearly, oh, I got it right. Cool. Oh, I got it right two times in a row. Oh, I got it right three times in a row. What are the rules and parameters of what we're practicing? So this is practice design. What's our goal? What's, what do we want to get better at? What's an exercise we can design? This is what I do mostly when I'm teaching or in my courses, um, designing a way to practice that as crystal clear rules. So we can just really work on it and know, did I get it right? Did I get it wrong? So I like, I'll spend an hour just designing some way to practice something. And then, um, it's worth it because then if it really works, I can, I can really practice that thing. Like, and, and, know that I'm targeting it on getting better at it. If it. Even if I practice it for 10 minutes um, after working on designing it for an hour, that's better than if I just dilly-dallied around for an hour. So just practice design and making sure we have parameters that are specific. And you can ask questions about um, in the Q&A. Feel free to ask about how do I get better at this? How do I get better at this? Um, okay, the next thing. Uh, this is item number seven, and I, I promise I'll try to go faster here. Uh, all I want to say is this one can, can be helpful. Focus on consistency over quality. Uh, now, that's contradictory a little bit. Some of these might be contradictory. You can try on any of these for whatever's helpful. Um, consistency over quality. I just talked about quality. I just talked about deliberate practice. Um, but this is just what works for me. Uh, if I'm not feeling it some days, I still show up to keep the barrier to entry Think of it as like water tension. Like I want to keep a foot in the water 
uh, not have to have that difficulty of starting something again. Always starting something is the hardest thing. So I think of consistency over quality or consistency before quality. So if I'm trying to do something new, I'm like, okay, can I just make sure I'm at least doing it, even if I'm really not even focusing on it or whatever. And then once you're showing up uh, regularly, then we can say, okay, how can I do this better? How can I focus on quality? How can I? And so consistency before quality is something that I really like. Uh, next item. Um, this one is very important because of all the deliberate practice that I talk about, because I don't want this to come across as um, every time you play, it needs to be that ultra exerting deliberate practice. Nope, definitely not. Obviously, we want to have the whole point is so we can play music and have fun or express ourselves or play with people or whatever. So play for fun as much as you want. Of course, as much as you want. Intentionality is the point here, though. Um, and this point, I like to I like to use the fun playing, the just noodling around or playing or or playing with people, whatever version of non-deliberate practice, that's what we use actually as our compass to point out the red flags that then we can go to work on for real. If all we do is deliberate practice, we don't know what we're what we want to work on or why. So play for fun, play uh, with people or whatever your idea of like this is the ideal situation, and be taking mental notes or actual notes of what you know what am i feeling right now that ooh I, I wish i was better i know we all feel this like ooh that part is missing or i really wish i was better at that ooh that was embarrassing when that mistake happened or whatever so we can take notes of that so then we go when we go do deliberate practice we can say ah there's our little red flag list from our real life of music fun enjoyment playing expression whatever like ah now these are when i go and kind of nitty gritty work on real practicing with deliberate practice, I can work on that thing. Because I know that if I do, it's gonna bring me fulfillment and meaning and enjoyment for playing real music and having real fun, okay? I am trying to fly through these, so I'm gonna go on. Uh, this is something, this one is called the six month rule. I've mentioned this maybe in one other video. And this is just a nice thing I like to think of. If there's something new you're working on that is hard, don't assume that it will be a part of your real playing, your real expression, ready to go, uh, or even that you're, you know, quote unquote, good at it for six months. Um, this is really helpful and really important because these actually getting the skill internalized just takes a lot of time. Um, I had someone comment recently that was like, whoa, this is way too hard, whatever exercise it was. Um, this is way too hard. I tried it two times and, and still didn't get it right. And then I gave up and I was like, two times? Like, we need, to, we need to do like hundreds of times. And so the six month rule, um, if you're practicing something new and it's like, whoa, this is really hard, right? Whatever your biggest weakness is or big thing you've been avoiding because you just feel like this is something I'm not good at. Um, I don't know, whatever that might be for you. Maybe it's, um, and, and what you really care about, uh, just your technique or your ear training or your um, even just studying theory or um, your time, whatever. Uh, if we do start working on it for real, it's not gonna be a week, it's not gonna be two weeks, it's not gonna be a month when it's like in you. It's gonna be six months. And of course, that's not a hard, fast rule. It's just a nice amount of time that gives us room. Uh, it, it takes it takes a while. And it, yeah, it depends on how much you're working on it and whatnot, but um, that's nice, because that's not an amount of time that we're like, okay, cool, here it comes in a week, I'm better now. So, okay, next. Um, if you don't know how to if you don't know how to um, organize your practice time, these next few are just about that. One of them is, because um, now we talk about real practice, like, okay, I'm actually practicing and working on getting better. And uh, and then we want to have fun and play too. So if you don't know how to do it, just do a uh, 50-50 rule. Okay, I'm gonna spend half my time just noodling around, playing around, inspire, whatever, listening to music. And then I'm going to make sure that half my time, roughly, whatever way you want to think of it. So that's nice to think about. It's just a reminder again that our, we don't have to exert ourselves 100% of the time, 50-50. Like that's a good chunk of, of fun, fun music time. So 50-50 rule. Uh, okay, just a couple more. Uh, another amazing thing for practicing is that you have an outlet, so that you have somewhere to put it. Because what's gonna happen, even if so far everything I've said, I know I'm going for a while. If, you, <laughs> if you've been watching uh, this whole time, awesome, thank you for hanging out. I know it's a bit and it's the middle of the day, so it's a work day for a lot of people. Um, so having an outlet is so critical 
because even if you've done everything I've talked about so far and you're like, wow, I am practicing. I'm gonna... If we don't have somewhere to put it, we can easily fall into, great, I'm doing it. What's the point though, right? So where is it going? There needs to be some sort of flow. That can be anything. For a lot of people, that ends up being that you texted it to your sibling or you played it for your spouse or you um, played it for your kid or you uh, posted it online with a little Instagram story or whatever your your version of like, there needs to be an outlet and a con and a conscious outlet uh, instead of just waiting for, oh, oh I, I think I got, got good at this. What do I do? Okay, I guess I'll, you know, the outlet could also be just record video taping, <laughs> taping, video, <laughs> taking a video of yourself and um, and just keeping that as an archive for yourself or whatever. And then of course, for artists, uh, the ultimate outlet is like, okay, I'm gonna actually go perform or I'm gonna record this and, and try to really release it or but there's no wrong way to do it, but an outlet, um, have something that you feel like that you can imagine in your mind while you're practicing that it pays off because it's going towards something. Plus then that leads to a sense of completion. Really, again, it can be anything, but there's a sense of completion. So then you can, feel like there's a cycle that happened and then you go back and start again with something else or, or or try to improve more on that same thing or whatever. So outlet. Okay, almost done here and then we're gonna take questions. Um, and uh, hit me that thumbs up. I, I feel sound like such a YouTuber, don't I? Hit me that, hit, smash that thumbs up if you're liking this, um, which does help, but it's just sounds funny to ask for that. Um, so, Okay, another structure thing, if you're really not sure how to do it, and the first thing I said here, if you're if you're watching and you weren't at the beginning, is that every kind of structural thing we try to do around our practice is all a construct. There's no right or wrong way to do it. So we can mix it, you know, change it at any time. But, you know, if we have a bunch of things we're trying to practice and like, ah, oh, which one do I, which, how do I do this? How do I organize it? I need to warm up. I need to work on technique. I want to work on sight reading. I want to work on um, uh, songwriting. I want to work, it's just this, this big list of like, how do we get better at everything? Um, this is just a simple structure that you could try and it's just the four phases of your practice. One, warm up. I talk a lot, a lot about warm up. Some kind of warm up. Something you think of just mentally as warm up uh, phase. Could be any amount even. Uh, two, your main focus. You're choosing one thing that is like, here's what I really care about. I want to do the deliberate practice on this um, and, and that's your main focus. So that's phase two. Phase three, after you've done that and you should be tired, is your back burner items. So you have one thing that you're like, oh, I am really, really trying to work on this. And then there might be 12 things. Okay, now I wanna work on my arpeggios and now I wanna work on my um, my sight reading uh, out of the Charlie Parker Omni book or whatever it is. Uh, and, and we've all had this before, like, oh, all these things I wanna practice. So there's warm up, then your one main thing, you're choosing the one thing, and then your back burner items where you go just kind of fiddle around and touch on get in touch with and just you're not worried about even getting better at it you're just you're just saying hello there hello there thing that i want to get back to someday again keeping the barrier to entry open uh so then you just kind of rotate through ooh, a little of this ooh, a little of this and you're not like thinking i gotta do five minutes of this or whatever so you have that one thing which is gratifying and then everything else you're just kind of touching base on which helps immensely with saying ooh, that one really triggered me and inspired me i can't wait to choose that as my main thing next time okay and then the fourth one is play time total total whatever you gotta just do some let loose play time so that four structure in terms of practice routine structure is something to try out if you're uh, feeling in need of some practice structure um okay <laughs> just a couple more because i can't help myself i could have done like four different videos on this instead of uh, instead of all of these so uh, i will be quick promise uh, this one is just my favorite, which is that if we're sitting down to play music at all, that is a crazy amount of success already. I know that sounds, that might sound foreign, but like, what? We get to play music at all? What? We get to, we get to work on this? Like we made it. You made it. And so of course, when we're practicing sometimes or just throughout our day, we're like, I want this, I want this, and I'm I'm like that too. But to tap into this feeling of like, oh my gosh, I am playing music right now. And it's not about, am I good or whatever. You could have started yesterday, but you're making noise and sounds and letting that sink in as like, oh my gosh, I'm that is the most, I mean, as a musician, it's like insane quality time. That is insane nourishing time. And just the fact that 
like, whoa, I'm someone that was a that is able to sit here and play music at all. Like you're playing music. <laughs> you're doing it. Whether you think it's good, whether you think whatever, and whether anyone's listening, it's playing music just as much as anyone else is playing music. If they're performing on a stadium stage or you're playing by yourself and you just started, you're playing music and they're playing music. And and that alone is an is like, we made it. We made it. Now, of course, we might want some other things out of it, but like just to, it's, it's, it's a bit of a just mindset thing. And it gives me a big like sigh of relief, like a big breath that I can take. It's very meditative. It's very uh, spiritual ish that I'm just like, wow, I'm tapping into the world of music right now. And that's it. That's all you can do. You know, what else is there? There's the existential dread and, and uh, what's the point and all that until we can because you could have a lot of success and go tour around the world and still feel like something's missing. So I think this, you know, this element of no matter where we are in our journey, remembering that, wow, we're playing music right now. That's kind of it. <laughs> that's kind of the point. Like the point is that is happening. Uh, so that's one of my favorite things. Uh, next item, intermittent, intermittent learning, intermittent reinforcement. Uh, this it's funny. Each of these is, is so impactful. And I haven't talked about this one yet. We have this tendency and I've seen this over and over again with my students. We have this tendency to, to say, Ooh, this is the thing I want, or this is my latest assignment, or this is the thing that's important. Let's say I put out a video and, and, and you're like, Oh, chord tone soloing. Okay. That's the one thing. And then it's like chomp, chomp, chomp. All we do is chord tone soloing. That's it. And, and you're like, and then we have this feeling or, or let's say I got to get my scales down. Okay. I'm going to practice my, I'm just going to practice all my scales until they're perfect. Then they're perfect. So I'm set on that. I'm going to go practice something else. We don't want to do that um, for a number of reasons. One, there's no such thing as it's ever just good to go and you never have to practice it again. Two, it's just a really, really inefficient way to practice just in terms of learning uh, what's actually happening in your brain. Um, because if you chunk it all together like that, you will get good at it. But then when you go away from it, it's going to dissipate faster because you're not revisiting it. So if there are a bunch of things you want to work on, um, and I'll talk about this more in the future in more detail and kind of more of where the research comes from it. But we, we want to do more intermittent learning, intermittent uh, kind of practice sessions where um, you have space in between practicing something and you come back to it. So that t tells your brain, oh, we didn't do this thing for whatever amount of days or weeks or whatever uh, or hours or however you want to space it out. Um, but, oh, it's come back. We better store this in the more long-term ability because it might be a while before it comes back again and we need to be able to do it. So if you haven't watched the earlier part of the video, if you're there, I talked about homeostasis where it's like the brain is trying to, to say, oh, whatever that was that just used a bunch of calories, we need to get better at that. Uh, so if you space that out though, then then there's the ability, there's the structure of, of your ability and your body saying, um, oh, we not only need to be better at that to conserve calories when it happens again, we don't know when that's going to happen again. What if that happens in a year from now? We better store it in a way that's that's more long term. So it's a very effective way to I hope that kind of came across. OK, intermittent practicing instead of just like everything all at once, everything all at once, everything all at once doesn't work that way. OK, so and that doesn't mean your practice routine has to be two minutes of a million things and then you repeat like it's OK to not practice something you care about for days, for weeks, if you're practicing other things and kind of rotating and coming back. So usually this happens naturally because we're inspired by something and then we get inspired by something else. So just making that point, feel free to ask questions about that in just a sec. We're going to do the Q&A super, super quick. Just a quick quote here from James Clear, the author of Atomic Habits, which probably a bunch of you read because it was a mega, 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 still is crazy, like huge bestseller. Um, uh, something huge that was impactful for me from him was this focus on the system, not the goal. If you set up the system and you know, okay, showing up and this is related to when I practice it, when I play it all, I've made it. <laughs> this is related to, um, everything else we talked about, um, where you're not just wanting the result. Ooh, that's such a painful way to work on something. You do wanting, just wanting the result, uh, focus on the system. So, you know, when you show up, you say, cool, no matter how I feel, if I keep doing this, I'm trusting that it's going to focus on the system, not the goal. I love it. That's, that's James Clear. Uh, that's what I got from James Clear. Uh, okay, um, that's it. The last thing I was going to talk about is how I'm tracking my deliberate practice. 
uh, which I don't need to go into it too much. Basically, I'm just, um, I've done a million different ways of doing this. And like I said, they're all constructs. It's probably going to change soon anyway. But um, I am... I, I've done, I've done, like I said, I've done, tried everything under the sun in terms of how I practice structuring and everything. Uh, so sometimes I would time a session where the timer goes off and I did a certain amount, or sometimes I would just time it so it's just going and I see how long I practiced or uh, not time it at all or whatever or anything and everything. Now, right now, with the actual super, super hard deliberate practice, I am tracking, I got this from Cal Newport, who the, the, the author of Deep Work, which is a great book too. Um, I'm tracking the amount of deliberate practice, like actual deliberate practice. So I will practice two hours and then um, when you know, I'll play around and say, okay, I'm ready to focus on this in, in the, 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 the parameters are set up. Like I know exactly what the weakness is I'm working on. I, ha I, I know when I got it wrong. I know when I got it right. I know what my goal is for how many times I wanna get it. Okay, I'm gonna start this timer that just counts and I'm gonna focus as hard as I can on this. This is like sprinting, that sprint. Okay, I'm gonna sprint as hard as I can. And, and then as soon as I lose, uh, stop that or lose focus or whatever, I stop that. So I'm actually tracking my amount of like exerting time. So it's interesting. If I practice for two hours, I'll get maybe 20, 30 minutes of that, you know, within that. So I'm still playing that whole time or trying things or designing the practice or enjoying a little play time. Uh, but that real deliberate and it's making a difference. It's really helping me know like, OK, here's my true workout where I'm pushing myself. And then here's the kind of playtime around it, which for a lot of us, that playtime around it is all we ever have been doing. Um, so that's just a little update, a uh, new thing I'm trying. Um, in addition to new thing that this is going live for the first time and new thing that I have a mustache. So in the mood for new things. Uh, wow. Okay. I knew, I knew I'd end up going super long because that's just mm, what I do. Uh, but let's, um, let's open it up for questions and thanks for being here. And, uh, so, so excited to be doing this. Um, and I interacted a little bit at the beginning and that was really fun. Um, but yeah, if we want to do and any questions, and of course, if you don't have any, that's fine too. Um, but if you did type a question in before, I'm probably not, I'm not going to see it. Cause I, I'm not really going to be able to scroll through right now. I love that you're leaving comments. Um, so I'm going to look through all those later, but, uh, but if you did have something, type it in again, if you don't mind, just so I can see it. Um, okay, here we go. Al, um, I'll get stuck off in le learning a song. Here, let's, here we go. That's what I'm supposed to do. So everyone can see it, right? Um, I get stuck off in learning a song without a focus on the theory. But when I focus on scales and intervals, I have a difficult time in using it on uh, in a nonlinear uh, practical application. Okay, awesome. Uh, let me wrap my head around this a little more. I'll focus on scales and intervals. Yeah. Um, so I'm hearing you say you're, you know, you're working on learning a song, which sounds like, okay, I want to learn this song, but then it bothers you. And I talked about this during the lesson here. It bothers you. The red flag goes off like, oh, but there's something missing while I'm practicing this. I wish I understood the theory of it as I'm doing this. And then, so it sounds like you go and work on that, which is great. Um, then I focus on scales and, uh, intervals. I have a difficult time using it in a non-linear slash practical application. So linear practical application of scales and intervals sounds like that makes sense to you. Like, okay, I'm going to practice up and down the scale. I'm going to practice the interval, etc. cetera. Um, and then how do we end up using that in real music? One, in this live stream, I talked about the six month rule. So one, don't assume it's going to come quickly. That's your blank spot there that you're looking for. So give yourself the six month rule to say, okay, I'm going to work on this, but it's not going to feel like I can really use it naturally in my musical ability in a, in a real music situation for six months from now. That's, of course, it could come sooner, could come later. It's just like, a, it takes time. Uh, but the most important thing is, is to define, okay, what does that mean to me to use this, use this particular thing in a nonlinear practical application? What does that look like? We have to have, this is from Anders Ericsson as well. We have to have a mental model of what we're shooting for or else how can we ever get somewhere if we don't know what, you know, it's not going to land there if we don't know what we're shooting for. So what does it mean to use something like that in a, in a practical application? So that can be hard to, that's part of the design of, of our exercises, which I talked about as well. Uh, we have to think what, what really would this look like? And now let me design an exercise that forces me to use that skill. 
this is game over. If you can do this with what you want to learn, it's going to work. So with scales, okay, practice maybe. And if you want to clarify, you know, anything, Al, I'll, I'll keep an eye on the comments here, but let's just say the scales. Um, maybe what you mean by that is you want to improvise with the scale over the song. That's a great practical application. Can I improvise with the scale over the song? Okay, so then we need to just break down. Am I able to improvise with the scale over one chord of the song? If not, I need to design a way to practice improvising over this with one chord of the song. If we try that and we fail or don't like it, this is, I have to be general here because it, the best way to practice is to know the specific goals. And so um, the, just giving kind of general examples and going deeper and more and more narrow, just hypothetically here. Okay, let's say you try to improvise with a scale with one of the, with the first chord of the song and you, you fail at it or you don't like it or it's not what you want. We have to identify what about it is not what we want. Okay, it sounds, here's a common thing, it sounds like a scale <laughs> instead of a, a melody. Uh, it just sounds like I'm going up and down the scale. Oh, interesting, it sounds like I'm going up and down the scale. Well, then maybe I should play, uh, create an exercise where I don't start on the root create an exercise where I am breaking up the scale. That's why I have a, like a lot of, I have a couple of videos on scale patterns where it's like a melodic pattern where you're breaking it up. Uh, maybe I need to be using phrasing so it's not just straight eighth notes, right? Whatever it is, we need to design and define. What does it mean to me? What is it? Notice how narrow I'm getting with it. And it's all for that end goal. And it's not gonna come quickly, but it will come and anyone can do it. Um, but you just want to define, 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 uh, clearer and clearer. So um, as far as the intervals, uh, seeing the theory of it goes, um, same thing. Just say, what, what do I actually want to be experiencing and knowing? And then get, get narrow and narrow and narrow until it's such a singular thing that you want to work on. And then cr you have to define the parameters of an exercise that force you to think of it that way. And then keep doing that and let it take time. Al, let me know if that helps and or if, if, it, if there's any, um, if, if you need further clarification, because I want to help you. So just let me know. I hope that helps. I'm going to move on to another question. I love the questions here. Uh, ah, uh, Chaylin, um, I hope I pronounced that right, Chaylin. Uh, practice routine. Yeah, uh, watch the replay because I, I went through a segment um, I'll, and I'll put a little, I'll put the little timestamp marks in it later. But uh, I talk about, the four pillars, the four kind of categories of a, of a great practice routine that you can try, uh, which are warm up phase, focus on one main thing phase, back burner phase, we touch base on everything else you ever wanted to practice and or you know think you should be practicing, and then just a playtime phase. But watch that segment, uh, that's going to be helpful for you. Um, okay, David, how do I keep? Uh, how do you keep sharp on more than one instrument at once? I find myself losing ground. Uh, one instrument whenever I practice another for too long. Yeah, yeah, totally. And same with the specific skills on one instrument, right? Or same with kind of balancing um, anything in our life. Um, the answer would be one, the more we can do the quality deliberate practice with each thing, the more we are uh, just getting ahead of the game, right? 10 minutes of serious, serious practice gets more done than like three hours of playing around. Um, of course, we still want to play around. So all that stuff applies, right? If we can get that skill down, that applies. The other thing that's helpful that uh, if you didn't see it in it earlier is the intermittent thing, that it's okay to have breaks from something and then come back to it. And that actually reinforces our long-term ability and our long-term memory to have um, inter intermittent. So you don't have to be doing everything every day is is basically the the idea there and it's actually even better to not do everything every day and to space to space it out um but i'd say that challenge is the same thing a lot of it people are experiencing with even one instrument with multiple skills but i work on singing and i work on guitar um and uh, a little bit of piano though i'm out of the phase of that right now and and that's okay with me um so so th that's that's my answer um keeping sharp is one of the kind of most frustrating things about getting really feeling like we got really good at something because then you kind of have to maintain it. So uh, try to only work on things that you really know that you're going to want to use and not just because we feel like we should know it or because um, it's just competitive or something or we just want to do it out of, uh, you know, ego of wanting to play fast. But like, do we care about music that's, you know, playing fast for an example, do we care about playing music 
that is fast or do we just want to play fast because we feel like uh, as a musician we should be able to do that be careful with that because we cannot even the best of the best of the best in the world can only reach its tiny raindrop of skill and ability compared to the ocean of what's possible so make sure you're really working on stuff that you want to really use in real music if you do that then the using in real music will reinforce it and it'll show you those red flags to go back and practice it so um so try to balance between your instruments um in whatever kind of way kind of intermittently and just don't stress if you're out of the phase of one instrument and you're more focused on one i think the most important thing is that we feel like we are practicing. There's so many things I want to practice, but if I get the quality practice on one thing at a time, in a moment at a time, I'm like, done. Like that, I, I am so happy to have done that. Um, I'm not, it, it's, and it feels so good that I don't worry about the other things uh, because they will come as well if you rotate, rotate around to them. So if I'm not using something in real music, but I really do care about practicing it and but I don't practice it for like a year. I'm all about the long game. If I don't practice it for like a year, um, but I am doing quality, deliberate practice that feels nourishing at, with something else that I care about, that's enjoy, then fantastic. And then you can build off of that with the other instrument later. So I hope that's helpful. There, with a lot of this stuff, there's not you know gonna be only one way, but that's some, some of my thinking behind it. And I hope that helps David. Uh, and if anyone feels like you need follow up or, you know, if there's confusion about anything, just uh, let me know. Uh, let's see. Richard, old teacher told me he thought some are born with speed. How can you improve your finger speed? And when did the mustache happen? Great questions. Um, nobody is born with speed. I'm sorry. I disagree. Uh, I I, I, I disagree with a lot. I hear so many nightmare stories. I'm not that this is a nightmare story, but from being a private teacher for a long time, oh my gosh, the amount of people that came to me and had trauma or just issues from like things that past teachers said that had to do with, oh, maybe you're talented or maybe you're not, is so sad because that really affects people. I had a student that uh, came to me and his first teacher, first lesson said, Ooh, you might, you know, let's evaluate your playing. Or, ooh, you might be one of these people that uh, just naturally does not have a rhythmic ability and you can never play in time. And like, he's like, what? Oh no. And then he came to me after two lessons from that person and told me that. And I was like, and I spent, and, and he still brings it up sometimes, like that affects people. And I was like, and now this student, by the way, is playing in time wonderfully. Like there's, that is not a thing. That is, that is crazy. Um, same with speed. Nobody's born with speed. That's insane. How can you improve your finger speed? Uh, you do it with deliberate practice. So if you, if you didn't see the early part of this, uh, binge through the, the video and the replay and really think about how can I apply these things to speed? Um, identifying what you want to, you know, the actual goal, the stretch goal. Therefore with speed, it's, it's a little bit straightforward because you can say, I want to get to this tempo. So all that stuff applies. Maybe you already were here live and saw all that. So I'll give you two other speed uh, tricks. One is called a speed burst, which you're at a tempo and you find your max, max, max tempo. And the, the tempo that you like can barely do it. You like almost break down. And if you go too long, you break down and or just right there that, at that tipping point. And then you do what's called a speed burst, which is you play half speed, you, whatever you're trying to play, scale, anything, lick, doesn't matter, anything anything finger style uh you play for you know half of that speed and then you play the full speed or you can say half then double that or whatever it is and then half that and you rotate you play it once the slow and when you play it slow you say ah this is how it should feel this is how relaxed it should feel this is how the tone should feel this is the mu this is how i want to experience it at the fast speed and then you do it fast speed and you go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And when you do it the fast speed, what happens? We tense up or we mess up. And, you say, and then you do it, you play it usually two times at the fast speed because it takes up the same amount of uh, metronome time. And then you play at the slow speed and say, oh yeah, this is how it's supposed to feel. And here we go fast and okay. And then this is how it's supposed to feel. And as you do that, you bring with you some of that, that, so that feeling of the slow speed into the fast speed. Um, and it's a reminder constantly. Whereas if we do what we usually think of, which is like we gradually get faster and we don't go back to that kind of checking with ourselves, we learn tension. We learn how we're playing 
we forget where all this tension comes from and like, oh, now I'm playing fast, but we don't go, we don't remind ourselves. Well, what can it feel like without all those habits we gained along the way of, of speed? So speed burst is huge. The second thing is have three tempos, have your max, max, max tempo, have five BPM lower than that and have five BPM lower than that. So when you start your time work, you, your, your speed work, you start at the, the first one. And during that session, you go up to the five. And then during that session, you go up to the, your max and you keep track of this. And then when you're at your max, you do the speed burst or you do the speed burst on all three. And by having the three, it just helps. You don't want to just dive into your fastest. And then you watch how all three of those bump up over time. So hopefully that helps Richard. Uh, nobody's born with speed. Anybody can do it. It's, it's like, um, it'd be like if someone said some people are born with biceps, like Matt, like awesome, uh, muscle, muscle building biceps. No, we know that when you see someone with giant biceps that they've been doing this a bunch. That's it. That's it with speed. Um, that's it with everything. Um, okay, time frames for the, let's, uh, here we go. Sid, uh, thanks for all the questions and comments, everybody. Um, time frames for the focus practice should look like what? Okay, you're in intense concentration for two minutes or so and then come back to it tomorrow or something else. Awesome question, Sid, really good. Um, so what I'm doing right now, uh, which I shared about a little bit is that I am turning on my timer for the like actual focused, deliberate practice. Um, and I'm not turning on a timer that goes off. I'm turning on a timer that just counts. And as soon as I know that I'm out of it or like, okay, I lost, I lost, I'm not in it as hard as I can be. I stop that timer until I can do it again. And then I just, you know, do that a few times in a session. And like I said, some days it's been like 20 minutes of that or so. Um, not, it, not more than that. Um, and, and the, the research has showed us that even the best of the best in the world can't do that for more than an hour and a half at a time, which is crazy. Usually it's like 45 minutes at a time and the best in the, of the best of the best of experts in the world, uh, can't do more than like two to three to four to five at the very most hours a day of actual practice. Um, so, but your question, uh, two minutes or so, and then come back to it tomorrow or something else. So I, I hope that answers it, it. Yeah. Two minutes, honestly, if you can do two minutes, that's more than most people do, right? That's like sprinting for, for your short amount of time. And like, that's more than most people sprint. Um, and your body's going to say, Whoa, what was that? We need to increase those neural pathways to make it. So yeah, that's easier next time. Um, and then, yeah, you do it again the next day or you, or, or you do that type of practice with something else the next day and you, and you come back to it later. It doesn't have to be the same thing every day. Um, so I hope that helps Sid. Good, 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 good question. Uh, Nick Mac, do scales come from chords or do chords come out of scales? I tend to say scales are the mother of chords. Yeah. Uh, chords come from scales. Yes. Um, and check out my chord theory series. Uh, it's on the main page of my channel. Uh, chord theory series. I think it's called how to, uh, how to play, <laughs> how to learn guitar chords is what I first called it. And I kept it that, uh, it goes from beginning to advance on how chords are structured and, and, and made. And, uh, the first thing I go over in the first several videos is we have to know scale structure and then learning how chords come from scales. So yeah, absolutely. Nice. Good question. Mac, uh, Mick Mac, uh, Mark. Hey, uh, when I'm looking at a long standard, uh, jazz standard, I am guessing, uh, and I want to work on chord tone improv. Do you think breaking it into sections and nailing those one at a time is a good idea? Treat them as parts, I guess. Yes, the answer is yes, uh, but also that it doesn't have to be. The most important thing as you know, per on topic from what we've been talking about this whole time, the most important thing is that you have a clear, um, clear parameters. That's it. So it clear parameters that are within your stretch zone of your stretch goal. If it's too hard, then how, then, then we're not improving, right? We're just like, can't even work on it. If it's too easy, then we're, then we're not working on it either. So the answer is there's not a best way. It's just that the design of the way that you're working on it needs to have very clear parameters. For example, if you are working and I do it in all, all these different ways, I'll play through the whole tune with chord tones and just see, oh, how did I do? Right. And that's not even deliberate practice. I'm just like, let me try to play and have fun. Let me try to make real music. And then I say, okay, what if I want to like super, super nail this? Okay. Well, I'll say, I need to define the way I'm practicing with the chord tones, which I'll say, it just needs to be extra clear. Okay. Maybe I'm going to go ascending and descending in the one position on the fretboard and always connect by step when the next chord tone comes. That's the exercise design. And then what chords you use it on is kind of like whatever chords you can, right? If you can do that at a certain tempo through the whole tune, then you're sticking to the parameter of the exercise. Great. If you can't, then you do it on two chords at a time looping. 
then you can do it on four chords at a time looping. Um, maybe you can do it on the whole tune super slow and you're focused and that's working. Maybe you notice where it breaks down and then you work on just the two chords where, like let's say that dominant seven sharp five chord comes up and those shapes are notoriously more difficult and more vague or just foggier for us. So, okay, I gotta work on that, right? So there's not a best way. What's, what's important is that the parameters are set in the exercise and that when you work on the exercise, it's crystal clear when you're doing it right and when you're doing it wrong. Um, and then when you're doing it wrong, you stop and you start over. Or, you know, when you do it right, you say, cool, I did it right. I didn't even talk about my uh, kind of checkoff method. I'll talk about that in a future video. If you do something, if you say, here's how I do it right and you do it right, I, use a, I just have picks sitting on my desk and I slide it over. Say, I did it right. And I got to do it at least three times in a row before I say that I did this or I move on from it. So hope that helps, Mark. Um, Adam from Jamsville. Check out Jamsville. Uh, Check out Adam is from Jamsville. Check out his channel. Uh, <clears throat> oh, awesome. He's just commenting for Mark. That's great. So thanks, Adam. Uh, in a 251, I would play 5-7 on the 2 and 5. Try it if you're beginning. Cool. Thanks for the suggestion, McMack. Just suggesting for the people. I'm going to keep going with questions here. Uh, just to get it right. Deliberate practices used specifically for single issue learning improvement stretches and in addition or besides the regular practice session. Um, I wouldn't say that it, I guess I'm kind of talking about it for me being uh, s besides the regular practice session. I'd say it's inside. It, it's the point of practice. If you're talking about actually improving, it's, it's the way to improve. I'm just talking about it being cushioned within my time that I'm playing music, that I'm recognizing the reality that I'm not always in my time sitting and playing or practicing that not every moment of it is real deliberate practice. So I'm just trying to delineate that and be real with myself and try to, inc and now I'm just trying to increase my fitness for how long can I do it for and, and, um, stay focused and, and improve super seriously at one thing. Uh, but yeah, it's definitely a single issue thing. A single one thing it is pretty critical of it. It has to be one thing that you're wanting to work on and stretch towards. Yeah. Um, but I wouldn't say it's besides the regular practice session. It's, I'd still say it's the point of practicing is to, it, that's what real practice is. It's just, oh, sometimes we have to ease into it or sometimes we have to play and just noodle around and notice what do I care about working on? We have to care about it to, to work that hard on it. So hope that helps. Um, Lavat, Hey, and I don't think, I don't, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right. Anyway, Lavat and I have been, uh, uh, talking for a while. Uh, thanks for showing up. Uh, what hugely helped me in learning is that our brains only allow us to do one thing at a time. Yes. Yeah, so instead of learning right and left hand and vocals, it's treated all as one thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And looking groovy. Thanks. And he's talking about the mustache. Um, yeah, absolutely. And I talk about this on, on a lot of my videos too. You cannot focus on more than one thing at a time ever rotating around what you're actually focusing on one thing at a time. And that could be rapid, right? Like one moment you could be like, oh, how's my wrist position? Next moment you could be like, oh, how hard am I hitting? Like, but it is one thing at a time and that rotation is helpful. So uh, we should probably call it soon. I'm gonna just see what other comments we hear. Um... <laughs> Colm does not like the stash. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> But yeah, uh, check out the replay if you want to. We went over some really good stuff. Uh, okay, AJ. AJ, hey how to be able to play any arpeggio starting from anywhere on the fretboard without calculating? Uh, great question. The answer is that you have to calculate it until you don't have to. You have to until you don't have to. So that's that's a lot of what we're talking about now. That kind of cerebral part of just like, oh, what am I doing? What am I doing? Uh, you have to calculate it enough so often, so frequently, so uh, many times that at some point you don't. That's that's the path and you do it, do that with focus. So it's not going to happen. You're not going to end up uh, just, you know, do, if you do end up just playing something without calculating it and you don't have that pathway of having mapped it out intentionally over time. That's how people get into the physical habit of things and saying like, shoot, I don't know what I'm playing. So let the calculation be there. Let the calculation be there. And what happens is you get faster at calculating it. Oh, I'm playing the third. Oh, I'm playing the root or whatever you're doing that, you know, works for you. Like, oh, I'm playing this. Oh, here's the, the shape. This comes from this scale, whatever it is, you know, these calculating things and you get quicker and quicker and quicker until it's not an explicit thought and calculation. It's simply knowledge. 
right? Just like knowing someone's name, someone you're close to, your friend, you don't think, I got to remember their name. Oh, yes, their name was Sergio or whatever their name was. I don't know why I thought of that name. This, you, you want to have it that clear in your mind. Whereas we do have to do that uh, when we're meeting someone that we met once or twice. You're like, oh, shoot, what was their name? Uh, or whatever. And, and so it has to just be like something that we know, but for what we didn't have to think about it, which is a lot of stuff that we know a lot like flu. That's what fluency is. You don't have to stop and think about it. You just have it. So the calculation has to be there until it doesn't. AJ, good question. Really good. Um, John, okay, I wish you could just sit down uh, with the teacher and ask, how do I do this? How do I do that? How can I be my own teacher? That's a lot of what we're talking about, John. Uh, really good question. I mean, getting getting real feedback from a teacher is like um, is amazing. Nothing really replaces that. But a lot of what we're talking about is how we can be our own teacher in terms of evaluating where, if we can determine where we're breaking down on something, where the weakness is, where the, where the spot is that needs work. That's most of what a teacher does. The other half of what I shouldn't say most I'd say that's half what they do the other half they do is design a way to work on it that's effective and that's the part we can learn how to do for ourselves if we can know what we're needing improvement on in a very specific way and then design the parameters for how to work on it with you know crystal clear here this means I did it right this means I did it wrong and now I can work on it deliberately you are being your own teacher okay that is all that is what I do for people when I teach uh, and, and can do feedback and stuff now we don't know what we don't know, so we might be doing something wrong that we can't identify. That's when getting feedback really does help. But if you can work on that ability to design your own your own exercises and then work being able to do deliberate practice, you're you're like ninety percent ahead of of how most of most people are practicing. So, um, H K, thanks for the compliment. I just said thanks for the great teaching. Appreciate that very much. Um, okay, so we yeah. I'll go just a couple more since we're still got all, I, I love answering questions and whatever. If it's a long live stream, it's a long live stream. Uh, so I just, I, I'm happy to, to do this for a little longer. So let's just roll with it. Um, so I'll go back to where I was. Oh no, I lost my place. I lost my place. Bear with me, bear with me. Cause I went down to see how many comments there were. Uh, okay, here we go. We'll, we'll we'll get a we'll get a few more. Hey, I could hey, maybe. How long can live streams go? I don't know. Maybe I'll sit here and just keep answering questions. I'm I'm loving it. So, I'm a beginner, and uh, I know the pentatonic scale, cage system, and triads, but nothing related to jazz. What should I learn first if I want to play some Kenny Burrell? Oh well, cool question. If you want to play some Kenny Burrell. What you should learn first is anything Kenny Burrell played. That's it. And then use these principles we're talking about in this video to practice it really f seriously. Um, so whatever that is that Kenny Burrell played that you want to play, then work on what <laughs> Kenny Burrell played. So it's a great goal and it's it's wonderful to work on what other people played. So transcribing a little bit of a Kenny Burrell solo um, and or if you want to find a transcription of it or a book of it or whatever. So um that's it. And boy, is that a fun way to practice uh, transcribing, working on what other people played and whatnot. So I know it's a simple answer, but that's that's the answer. And and that's that's like um, that's like um, traveling through time. I mean, that's that's accelerating in a crazy way to work on the playing what the masters played and trying to play along with them. Tried and true way, especially talked about a lot in jazz. Um, Let's see. Uh, okay, good. I answered one of Al's questions. Helpful for sure. Glad that was helpful, Al. Uh, going to be one more easily, more easily transpose keys and melodic improvisation with any key without sounding wooden. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe more chord tones. Yeah, well, playing just chord tones can sound pretty kind of contrived as well. People talk about that. Just like, you know, I'm stuck in the pentatonic scale or, oh, I'm only playing chord tones. So um, again, this intuitive ability to identify while we're playing, what do I wish that was like instead of what it was? And, and sometimes that's hard to define, but we need to evaluate that. What do I wish that sounded like? What do I, what, what's missing, right? So if we're playing just chord tones and we're crushing it on that, which I have videos on that, please check those videos out. It's, if you're interested in jazz improvisation, especially, or any improvisation, improvisation, practicing chord tone improvisation over chords, super cool, but limiting, right? It can sound like this doesn't sound like the music I listen to. This doesn't sound like melodies. Well then, well, what do I wish it was? I wish it was more, uh, had, 
more notes connecting between them. Okay, I better look, figure out what maybe the scale work will do that. Um, and can I design a way to add more notes or whatever? So um, it's, I'm saying this in a vague way because it's not just maybe more chord tones because I can't say that because it has to be maybe more of whatever you are like, what's missing and I need that. And that could be different for different people. So for some people, it's maybe more chord tones. For some people, it's maybe less chord tones, right? And defining and, and setting the parameters is the way to go. So um, moving on. Uh, HK, I follow vocal melody. Is it possible to nail the key of a song if it is diatonic? If if what you mean by nail it is identify it, yeah, absolutely. If it's diatonic, then um, you should be able to identify the key of the song, yes. Um, unless it's just a few notes and we don't know what scale it's from. So, um, <laughs> William, can we have a demo on singing, playing keyboard, guitar, and unicycle all at once? Almost. I couldn't do the keyboard part, but I could sing and play guitar and unicycle all at once. Uh, I said when I hit 100,000 subscribers, I was going to do an actual lesson, like a, as the, a good teaching lesson on the unicycle. Uh, so I set myself up for that. Uh, and I'm a ways out from that, but uh, I'll do it. I'll do it when I get there. Um, okay, moving on with just a few comments here. Cool. I love it. Y'all are interacting with each other too. McMac, what strings do you use? Uh, just Diodario. I use a, a set of 11s uh, a gauge. Um, nothing special. I'm like super, super not a gear person. And that's why I've never talked about, I don't talk about gear on my channel. I don't, I don't talk about stuff like that. I just talk about practicing and musicianship and exercises. I, I, I don't change my strings very often. I just keep them clean. Um, and so they're a little bit dull because of that. And that's part of the sound that I have too. I just don't change them that often. And I just, and they're just like typical Diodario wound wound strings and that shows how little I kind of know or, or think about it that I'm just like uh what uh, I think it's 11 through 11 through 46 is the is the gauge range so um I'll talk about more of my thoughts on gear on the channel in the future uh uh John there's so much to sort through on my own yes I, I feel you can you talk uh, a little bit about how to focus on what goals are important um such a good question such a good question because there is no goal that is actually important. <laughs> we have to feel that for ourselves. Like they're objectively speaking. Yes, they're important because we can feel that we can feel what's important. We have to know for ourselves. We have to. Objectively speaking, there is nothing that anyone should practice. That n nothing anyone needs to practice. There's nothing that all musicians should do. You could have amazing musical expression. You could have an amazing musical career. You could have amazing, just profound uh, musical execution and never practice a scale in your life. Never know what a scale is. <laughs> so there's nothing anyone should practice. So we have to, what's important is only what we know is important. And, and getting, there is an ability of like getting in touch with that too. Um, and when we're triggered by something because, because, someone else did it or someone said we need to do it even on my channel i'm like this is important but i always say and if you can ever find me not saying this as as part of how i frame things then then you caught me but i'm pretty sure i've never said in anybody should practice anything or anything is important unless there is an if as part of that statement this is important if if you want this result this is important that's the only time it's important so if you want to improvise over chord changes accurately. Chord tone improvisation is important. If you don't want that, it's not important at all. Uh, so we shouldn't waste our time with it. Um, if you want to understand um, exactly what you're playing and how music fits together on the fretboard and blah, 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 but then studying your music theory and mapping out the fretboard is important. If you want to write songs and you don't care about it, you're just hearing it and feeling it and you don't care, if you don't care about that, it's not important. And no one can ever say that it is. So, um, the, yeah, that, that's, that's, I'm very passionate about that. And I'm really glad that you asked that. I actually, I actually, cause I did a video, I think I mentioned that in a couple videos before, or just maybe one in particular. And anyway, I made this little like graphic post thing that I posted on Reddit that said something along the lines of, uh, there's nothing any, there's nothing that any musician should practice. It's only, you know, what you need to decide for yourself. 
in it. I'm paraphrasing it poorly, but some it was, I quoted my own video and, and put this on Reddit and it like created it, it it like blew up on Reddit and created this huge fight because uh people were really triggered by that and they said this is this is BS. If you want to be a professional musician, you have to practice this and you have to practice this and da da da. da. I I disagree. There's there's nothing other than what we need to know. We need to know in our souls, you know. We need to search within ourselves and, and find those things. And when we find those things, ooh, it's the best of the best because then you're you're so on track with your own uh, fulfillment. And it should be all about feeling meaning and feeling fulfillment. What else is there? What else is the point? You know. Um, so hope that helped, John. Uh, awesome, awesome question. Um, Yasin, uh, sorry if I'm butchering your name, but g gave it a shot. Um, any tips on linking pentatonic scale positions? I usually just choose one uh, position to improvise with all along the track. Um, yeah, I have videos on that. I have a couple of them that go over it in detail. Uh, so instead of describing it here too much, because there's so many ways that you could work on that, uh, send me an email jared at soundguitarlessons.com and I'll hook you up with specifically those videos which, which will help you uh, work on that. A uh, lot of ways to lot of ways to do that. So send me an email um, and I will give you a direct link to those. Um, cool. Awesome, awesome. Oh, my friend, David Balotero. My very good friend. David and I were in a band together for years. A crazy, hilarious band. We played like jazz, uh, kind of free jazz, experimental prog, whatever. It was it was all over the place. Thanks, David. Appreciate the approval of the mustache. So awesome. I don't know if you're still on the stream, but awesome to see you here. Thanks for showing up. Um, okay, I'm gonna actually skip some of these. Um, Mac Mac. Woohoo! Thanks, super chat. That's my first super chat ever. That's like a little donation thing in the chat box. So thanks. Because your course has made things more linear, uh, even if music is mu learning is non-linear. Uh, thanks so much, Micmac. That means uh, a ton to me. Um, yes, music learning is not linear, and at the same time, with all my courses, especially, I try to map it out as linear as possible. So we're just like, cool. I can do this, and then go to this next, and go to this next, and that's how I practice for myself too. Uh, Okay. Cool. We're we're getting done here. I'm gonna I'm going to uh, wrap it up, William. Oh, that's nice of you. Only pros enjoy answering questions, mate. Good on you. Uh, appreciate that. I, I I do love answering questions, uh, and um, never thought of it that way. So it's uh, okay to feel negative. You're hitting the right spots. Cool. It's okay to feel negative. Yay! You are hitting the right spots. Here. Yeah, that's what I said earlier in the in the stream that it's okay to feel negative about what you're doing, that we need to identify the negative things and then quickly bounce back and say, cool, if that's where I'm missing my abilities, then this is amazing. I hit a gold mine and now I know where the weak spot is to work on. And if you didn't catch that stuff, check out the live stream. Uh, cool. <laughs> Life's too short not to argue with internet strangers on Reddit. I love that. Okay, so we're gonna wrap it up here. Uh, it's, Opportunity for shameless plug. Got to click on this one. Al, awesome. Thank you so much for taking the time to answer these questions. Opportunity for shameless plug. Do you offer a course that covers some of the practice concepts here? Thank you for asking. Uh, oh my gosh, I have so I love making courses and I have so many in my head and, and really mapped out basically that, that I want to get out. It's so much work to, to make them though and make them at the quality that I want to. Um, I have a course in my back pocket that is going to come up and I don't know when yet. That is super super laid out all the practice psychology stuff like this and uh the name i already have a working title which is pra the practice code playbook um and it would go through you know in a super coarse linear detail way how to master all this stuff so i, I love that you asked that uh that that is something i think about all the time uh, and i'll be working on that i don't know maybe next year or something like that so thanks for asking um Cool. Uh, however, in all my courses, I, I, I discuss it enough that so people can succeed with the exercises. So, um, so okay. Uh, Eden or Iden? I don't know how. To, I, I sorry for for <laughs> getting it wrong. If uh, one of those is obviously wrong. Uh, fantastic first live stream. Looking forward to following uh, lives. Thanks so much. I really appreciate that. Well, you know, I have to say. Uh, so I'm gonna wrap it up here. Um, boy, I am so much more in my element with this. 
um, than producing the videos. I, I love producing videos, but um, I'm a bit of a polisher. I like production value and um, I like really outlining and mapping it out and get making all, and, and making sure all the graphics are in there for people so it's easier to follow along. And uh, it's a bit of a grind sometimes. It's not it's not my it's not as fun as as I, talking, asking questions. That's why I talk a lot of my videos too. I like to talk about uh, this stuff and uh, as much as I like to play. Um, so anyway, I, I'm so stoked to have, have done this. If you liked it, please let me know in the chat here, in the, in the comments, in the video afterwards, or send me an email, jared at soundguitarlessons.com. Um, if people find it helpful and valuable, I'd love to do this once a month, like on a schedule, on a lock schedule, separate from my weekly videos. I do, I'll keep putting out those every Tuesday. Um, and I think more than once a month might feel like a lot cause I want it to feel special. Uh, but once a month live stream where maybe I'll do a presentation on something and then take questions for like we did today. Uh, so please let me know if that, if like you're into that, uh, I'd love to add that to kind of my system and my routine that I do. So, well, thanks so much everybody for showing up, for watching. If you're watching later, thanks for, for watching this, uh, leave a comment, hit the like all the YouTube -y things. Um, and, uh, yeah, thanks for all your questions here in the live chat. And just for hanging with me and talking about this, like I said, this is one of my favorite topics of all time. Um, and I just love reading about it and, and thinking about it and working on it. And so to whatever extent that that's, I found valuable stuff in there, I want to share it with you and, uh, and put it out there and hope it helps other people. So, um, so that's it. And, and this, you know, this is my, I thought, oh, I put a video out every Tuesday, no matter what, I'm just going to do it live this time. And, uh, but the future live streams, I think will be, so I don't want to mix those up. I'll have it be, I'll have it be a separate thing, but, uh, but that's it. That's it for today. Uh, I guess I should, as always, I talked about it at the beginning. Um, if you want to apply some of this hardcore deliberate practice stuff, you know, obviously work on whatever is important to you. Uh, the hardest thing I have is my, out of my free downloads is probably my chord tone arpeggio pack. So uh, if you want to just test out, ooh, like what's a, I'm going to try to get this arpeggio shape down and map out the whole fretboard. That's probably the most difficult thing I have for like, oh, can I get this all down? Uh, so you can try your super focused practice with that. Uh, there's a link in the top of the description for that, for my chord tone arpeggio pack or you can go to soundguitarlessons.com slash chord tones. It maps out 12 different chord types, each of those in five positions. And it's the all of the shapes that I use necessary to nail the chord changes and play chord tones and target chord tones of any jazz progression ever. Uh, I, I use exactly those. And if, if you're like, wait, how does that work? Check out my chord tone improvisation videos. But yeah, download that if you don't have it yet. Um, if you're watching later, uh, leave a comment. And uh, let me know what you're practicing, what you're challenged by, what you're working on, what you're inspired by. Um, and that's it. I think we're going to call it. So, yeah, thanks uh, so much, everybody. And see you in another video soon. And as always, I think I've said this in every single video I've ever done. Happy practicing. <laughs>